Boy, Communion Sunday, this part comes up fast. <laughs> I needed more, more stuff, more music. You guys want to <laughs> sing me something? <laughs> this morning, our scripture lesson comes to us from the book of Galatians, chapter 6, beginning with verse 7. Hear the word of God. Do not be deceived. God cannot be mocked. A man reaps what he sows. The one who sows to please their sinful nature from that nature will reap destruction. The one who sows to please the Spirit from the Spirit will reap eternal life. Let us not become weary in doing good, for at the proper time we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all people, especially to those who belong to the family of believers. This is the word of the Lord. Be Will you pray with me? Almighty and everlasting God, we call you at this time, we call upon your name that we might hear the words that you have for us, the lessons that you have to teach us, and that we might apply those lessons and go forth from this place as those who plant seed for the harvest. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Man, you guys are so quiet right now. I need a little like, ugh. Just a little, ugh. What? Amen. Oh, there we go. That's right. All right, so. There was a time when no matter what seeds fell into our front yard, they would germinate and grow, whether we wanted it to or not. But it wasn't always that way, and it does not continue to be that way. When we moved into the house, the previous owners had planted some bushes that looked like tumbleweeds and surrounded them with decorative rock. So we figured this was an indication that nothing would grow there. Eventually, we removed the bushes and the rocks and planted some new flowering ground cover. And then we found out why it seemed that nothing would grow there. Rabbits. <laughs> the neighborhood rabbits would dine on whatever we planted there and would strip the land bare. After months of battle, we finally found a few plants that the rabbits don't like to eat, and we planted them. And much to our surprise, they grew. We felt victorious. As it often happens with kids, they like to plant all kinds of things in the yard, and ours were no exception. They planted rocks and Hot Wheels and Legos and bottle caps, and one summer, a peach pit. Peach trees are supposed to be hard to grow, so we did not think twice about it until Spencer was so excited about the random weed that was growing up through the jasmine. It was a peach tree. <laughs> of course, a peach tree growing in the worst possible place. I guess the rabbits don't like those either. When we returned home from the first cross-country road trip we took with our senior high students, I had brought home with me some yellow watermelon seeds from Oklahoma that had come from these delicious yellow watermelons that they served to us at a huge barbecue that they had for us with all the churches that were in the area. So while I was in Oklahoma, I washed a couple handfuls of these seeds and I thought that I had carefully dried them out, and then I threw them in a Ziploc bag, which created an unintentional greenhouse. <laughs> By the time we got home, the seeds had sprouted in the bag. And I can't remember how several of the germinated seeds had gotten into our front yard, but sure enough, by September, we had giant watermelon vines growing all over our front yard with watermelons growing on them. By October, we had enough small watermelons for Spencer to take to school for show and tell. He just happened to be assigned W as a show and tell letter. <laughs> Eventually, 
it was time for us to re-landscape. So out came the peach tree. We tried to replant it, but it was to no avail. And we took out all the other random growers in our front yard. Now we have out of control pomegranates, limes, and lemons, plus grass that won't grow well and ground cover that continually fails. I would love the look of an English garden, but I have neither the background, the time, nor the patience to create and oversee such beauty. But I do have soil that will allow the wild things to grow, the unexpected things to take root and flourish and produce fruit. In our yard, we have learned that we must be careful about what we sow because a harvest is sure to come. When I read this short pericope from Paul's letter to the Galatian church, I could not help but think about our church, about our families, about our family of faith. Over the past several weeks, we have explored through the word of God the notion of family, we have considered what family means and discovered that the definition of family is not just a mom and a dad and 1.7 kids. Family is what we make of it. Singles, married, divorced, estranged, blended, biological, adopted, fostered. It is comprised of those related and unrelated. God consecrated the idea of family to give us a foundation, a network of love and support. But that family can and will come in many sizes and shapes. We have examined how God wants us to treat each other as family members, how we show respect not only to our parents, but also to our children and to our brothers and sisters in faith. We were reminded by the Apostle Paul and others about the wisdom found in our elders and the mentors that we find among our congregation. Paul reminds us in Galatians that as we are drawn together as individuals, as singles or couples, as children or adults, as one generation or multiple generations, we belong together as a family of faith. We are all related through Christ, made one by our Creator and forged together through the power of the Holy Spirit. And Paul says, therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all people, especially to those who belong to the family of believers. Paul does not want us to get weary from doing good. He wants us to stay strong in doing good so that our good deeds will benefit everyone, including our family of faith. Paul knows that we are in a family way. Paul knows that we are pregnant with possibility. We are a fertile field filled with seeds of opportunity, seeds of hope, seeds of service, seeds of care and comfort. Our field has been sown and we must tend to that field so it might yield a tremendous harvest. We are planting seeds all the time through our actions, but we know that when a seed is planted, it does not bear fruit immediately. And just as nature has its seasons for planting and harvesting and resting, there are seasons in the soul, and we must give the seed time to take root and bear fruit. So if we fight spiritual fatigue, we will harvest what has been planted. Brothers and sisters, there are people in our communities, in our workplaces, in our schools, in our neighborhoods, who need a family of faith to call their own. There are people near who know only despair, 
because they only know how to sow to their own self. They don't know the good news, and they think that they have to satisfy themselves alone and on their own. But we know better. We know the abundant possibilities for healing in mind, body, and soul. We know the joy of the harvest even after a long planting season. In the book, Stories for the Journey, William White tells about a European seminary professor named Hans and his wife Enid. World War II forced them to flee to America where he found a job teaching. He was warm and gentle, loved by his students, and he brought the scripture to life for them. Hans and Enid were very much in love. Nearly every day they took long walks together holding hands. They always sat close in church until Enid died, overwhelming Hans with sorrow. Worried because he wouldn't eat nor take walks, the seminary president, along with three other friends, visited him regularly. And they remind, and, but he remained lonely and depressed. Experiencing the dark night of the soul, Hans told his friends, I am no longer able to pray to God. In fact, I am not certain I believe in God anymore. After a moment of silence, the seminary president said, then we will believe for you. We will make your confession for you. We will pray for you. So the four men met daily, asking God to restore the gift of faith to their dear friend. Many months later, as the four gathered with Hans, he smiled and said, it is no longer necessary for you to pray for me. Today, I would like you to pray with me. The dark night of the soul had passed, and instead of carrying Hans to Jesus on a stretcher, they had carried him on their prayers. This is the good that Paul does not want us to become weary of doing. We have fashioned this, we have been fashioned into this family of faith to be put to good use. We are the seed planters and the harvesters. If we don't plant good crops, good crops will not grow. The random weeds and the thistles of those planting their own self-interests will choke out the places to plant good seed. Who are those folks we know who could use a place to call home, who need some brothers and sisters, who need a family of believers, who will care for them and nurture them and love them as Christ does. Canyon Hills Presbyterian Church, the rabbit has died. We are in a family way. We are pregnant with possibility. But we must not grow weary. Some seeds take longer to germinate than others. Sometimes fruit is hard to recognize. I read a story recently about a young boy and a tree that was in his backyard. The tree was large and mature and had wonderful places to climb and explore, but it was not any longer bearing fruit. But to the boy, the tree was his safe harbor. When he had troubles, he would seek solace in the tree. When he wanted adventure, he would live out his fantasies of space travel or mountain climbing or sea exploration as he was climbing the branches of the tree. When he had complex problems, he would sit and ponder in the tree. The tree had become a great source of inspiration for him. One day he overheard his father say that since the tree was not producing fruit, he was planning to cut it down. The boy was crushed, but came up with a plan of action. 
The next day, he went to a friend's orchard with trees filled with fruit, and he picked a bushel of juicy, round, robust apples. And then he tied all the apples to the branches of his tree. The next day, his father could hardly believe what he saw. He told his wife the most amazing thing had happened. When he went out to cut down the tree, he found it filled with hundreds of juicy, round, robust apples. It was a miracle because the tree was actually a pear tree. <laughs> now, I am sure that the point of this story was how the little boy tried to save this fruitless tree. But even though the tree was not producing pears as one would expect, I would dare say that the tree was still producing fruit by providing this boy a place to dream, to imagine, to rest, and to explore. The tree's usefulness may no longer be in its ability to produce pears, but instead in its ability to provide solace. There is plenty of opportunity before us to keep doing good. We might be thinking we planted a pear seed only to find out really it was apples. Good fruit, nonetheless. Worth planting and tending and harvesting. Great harvests are laid out before us in this rich field, but we have to be willing to plant the seeds and not grow weary. For the good that we do will help not only our family of faith, but anyone near enough to benefit from the harvest. So church, these next few weeks is not a time to go fallow. Instead, the next few weeks are a time to plant seeds by doing good for others, by using our actions to sow seeds of faith that in time will flourish into an abundant harvest of unexpected blessings. God promises to bless our family of faith and instructs us to plant the seeds of those blessings for others. Amen.